This is a pathognomonic diagnosis. 64 year old man uh, has burning sensations on his lips and has this tongue. This can only be vitamin B12 deficiency or pernicious anemia. And indeed, that was the case. Uh, he's not anemic, which rather surprised me, but it doesn't matter. This tongue is pathognomonic anyway. He's got very large erythrocytes, which are consistent with vitamin B12 deficiency. Now the papillae on the tongue are uh, regenerated very quickly, similar to the regeneration of um, the gastrointestinal tract in general. And uh, with vitamin B12 deficiency and difficulties in one carbon unit metabolism, cell proliferation is impaired. And so the development of villi on the tongue is also impaired. First topic in the New England Journal was uh, coronary artery disease. And as we know, uh, coronary artery disease commonly affects all three coronary arteries and more than one lesion is present. For instance, in this uh, angiogram here of the right coronary artery, here's a stenosis here and there's a stenosis here. And in the circumflexus, there's a stenosis there. In the LAD, there's a stenosis there. And uh, we don't always know which lesions are the highest risk, although the lesion that causes the problem is generally known that is termed the culprit lesion. Now, the debate is whether or not the, solely the culprit lesion should be repaired, or if all the lesions that are observed should be repaired concomitantly. And the reason that this problem is a point of debate is because um, we really can't predict which subsequent lesions are going to cause problems in the future because the severity or the degree of stenosis is poorly correlated with the, which lesions cause the next problem. Uh, this problem has been debated in cardiology for some time. The earlier studies looking at just repairing the culprit lesion or repairing any, everything else that looks sick is a matter of debate. The earlier studies were small and didn't have the power to address this issue. Uh, this study is different. And here, the patients that had ST segment elevation myocardial infarctions were randomized to just have their culprit lesion repaired or to have anything else repaired that looked suspicious. So we can call this complete revascularization compared to no further revascularization after the culprit lesion is repaired. So there are almost 2,000, there are more than 2,000 patients in each of these groups and uh, uh, mean age is in the early 60s and uh, some have decreased renal function, although not many. Uh, current smokers are uh, uh, clearly represented. Hypertension is common, dyslipidemia is common, Previous treatments is also fairly common. Stroke is also, but at any rate, the randomization was successful. And how these patients are treated, um, almost all of them got aspirin, and some of them, and uh, after their procedure, they all get uh, P2Y12 uh, inhibitors, and uh, various drugs are commonly represented. ACE inhibitors is given to most of the patients. Almost all of them got a statin. So the randomization worked. Now, if we look at procedural characteristics, what was done to these patients, uh, the, patient, the patients that got the, only got their culprit lesion fixed, got their culprit lesion fixed, and all coronary arteries were represented here. And the patients that got everything fixed are shown on the left-hand column. Now, I guess we want to know what happened. And it looked like uh, the primary endpoints, cardiovascular death or myocardial infarction after a follow-up period of years uh, was less in the group that got everything fixed compared to the group that only got their culprit lesion fixed. And cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, or ischemic-driven revascularization, uh, major adverse coronary events, if you'd like to call it that, were also reduced in the group that got everything fixed compared to the group that only got their culprit lesion fixed. And if we look at the difference between these two treatments, 
it's not that great, uh, but it does amount to about 3%. Uh, so the number needed to treat to get one patient that has an advantage is about 30, which I guess is not so bad. And um, uh, primary uh, endpoint and secondary endpoint were both significantly different. And the secondary endpoint, the impact on the secondary endpoint was more than on the primary endpoint. And if we look at this forest plot of subgroups and whether it looked like it looks like complete revascularization is better than culprit lesion only PCI in this large study. So uh, this will this paper will have a major impact, I think, on the strategy of routine non-culprit lesion. PCI and patients that come in with a ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. The paper didn't tell us what Bernie Sanders had done, but he apparently had an ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. I presume the cardiologist in his case fixed everything. Now, the review in the New England Journal uh, was uh, two weeks ago was on Zika virus. And you'll recall that um, Zika uh, virus is a mosquito-borne virus that uh, is in the same family as dengue fever. First was described in the Pacific region associated with Guillain-Barre's syndrome, fairly high association. But subsequently, it was found that pregnant women that are, uh, have Zika virus infection uh, have a substantially increased risk of having uh, fetopathy or abnormalities in their newborns. And uh, Zika virus is a flabby virus. It comes out of the Zika forest, which is uh, close to Entebbe in Uganda. That's where the name comes from. And you can look at these clades of uh, 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 Zika virus line lineages, and that's shown here for people that are interested in that sort of thing. Um, the risk of uh, uh, fetopathy is uh, fetal loss is four to seven percent. Uh, microcephaly is about ten percent. Uh, a lot of the patients are asymptomatic and. The fetus may have be completely unaffected, but the risk of having um, fetopathy is substantial. And in uh, an analysis done in Brazil, uh, women that had abnormal infants at birth, uh, about 42% of them had had Zika virus infection. And we can look at the clinical manifestations of um, these unfortunate children that are shown here. So Zika virus is a problem and uh, details on the clinical presentations, brain abnormalities, ocular abnormalities, congenital contractions, seizure disorders, et cetera, are tabularly listed. And the problem, aside from Guillain-Barre, which was described in the Pacific region, uh, the primary problem with Zika virus is in pregnant women. In the general population, it's not necessarily recommended that these patients be treated subsequently or, or be analyzed subsequently. Um, if they're not pregnant, it's generally not recommended. And uh, newborns for in pregnancies that are not associated with Zika virus, Zika virus do not need to be analyzed further. The problem concerns pregnant women, and there are some recommendations here. Now, the Zika pandemic has waned in the last three years. It's not disappeared, but it doesn't seem to be as much of a problem as it was several years ago, although the authors of this review indicate that the large numbers of susceptible persons that reside in mosquito-infested regions make it highly likely that Zika virus will reemerge in the future. An image in the New England Journal, if you look at this patient here, he seems to only have problems on, seems to be a delineation of, uh, there's a left side, right side difference here in, the, in these nevi. 
which is uh, very impressive, although they're present on both sides, but the morphological characteristics of the nevi are also different. And we look at these nevi, they're distributed along lines. These are called Blaschko's lines. And if there's a left-right difference in these kinds of congenital problems, we could bet that this patient is some sort of a mosaic. And um, these um, nevi were sequenced and that was indeed the case. And uh, mosaicism is uh, fairly common in the animal kingdom. Patients that have Differing eye colors, left compared to right, are generally mosaics, and mosaics are also common in other organisms, as shown uh, in this picture of this cat here. Uh, this uh, image from the New England Journal we discussed several weeks ago, it, the left-sided picture here, this one, the picture looks, I would have called this gouty arthritis. But if we look at this x-ray, uh, this is not gout, and there's evidence of substantial periarticular calcinosis that's present bilaterally. And you'll recall that this patient had undergone a lung transplant and received voriconazole for seven years. And this is an example of voriconazole-induced periostitis. Uh, the fluorine atoms that are present in this drug is probably responsible for this effect, although that's not certain. Uh, but you should know about voriconazole-induced periostitis. You'll also be interested in the more recent breakthrough, also reported at least tangentially in the New England Journal. Uh, this concerns testis tissue transplantation to improve fertility of men whose testis tissues are deficient. And uh, this was a report on experiments performed in monkeys. Not much research on avoiding pregnancy is being performed nowadays, uh, but uh, research on improving fertility is now moved to testis transplantation. Then this topic in the, in the New England Journal interested me because I'm interested in this sort of thing. This has a, is of no clinical importance today, but it concerns the use of um, uh, medical records and other information that we can accrue on patients over the internet and Amazon and wherever else information can be found, and how this information can be applied to patients even without their permission. And uh, it concerns uh, Mrs. X collapses in the street and she's dragged to the hospital and Historically, the physicians learn that she has several chronic severe conditions and also is a cancer patient. Uh, the physician finds no do not resuscitate order uh, in any of her records. And then there's the question, should we resuscitate this patient or should we let her die? And uh, the scenario here involves uh, using an app. I'm not kidding using an app uh, to predict whether or not this patient would have wanted to be resuscitated. And um, so an uh, internet search is made in Mrs. X's uh, behaviors in the past to try to produce a likelihood of whether or not she would want to be resuscitated. The next patient, am I an organ donor? Uh, Mr. Y is trying to figure out whether or not he wishes to be an organ donor and he's having trouble reaching a conclusion. So he gets on his smartphone and answers a number of questions about his age, lifestyle, ethnicity, and core values. I'm not quite sure what core values are. Uh, I suppose they're opposed to more peripheral values and other topics. And so he consults an app that helps him make a decision on whether or not he wants to be an organ donor. And the discussant here <clears throat> discusses matters that are beyond human limits. And here's the next case. <clears throat> Mrs. Z has a massive stroke and is in the neuro neurological intensive care unit and perhaps, and apparently, uh, uh, is not being considered for lysis therapy or some sort of a, a, a 
neuroradiological intervention. So the physicians can't make up their minds what to do, and apparently Mrs. Z didn't leave a DNR, a DNR order, so the relatives are consulted, and uh, the physicians decide to let the relatives make the decision. That's not what I was taught to do in clinical medicine, but that's what's currently done nowadays. One of Mrs. Z's nephews is an attorney, and he recalls seeing an app that was designed for exactly this situation. This app also relies on artificial intelligence. So the relatives use an app to make a decision on what to do with their elderly aunt that's had a severe stroke. Sometimes I'm glad I'm too old for clinical medicine. So that's what this paper was about. And if you're interested in these, uh, uh, using how artificial intelligence and apps are going to help us make good ethical decisions. I'm not kidding. <clears throat> Excuse me. In The Lancet, we look at a 10-year follow-up on a large clinical trial in patients with generally three-vessel coronary artery disease that were randomized to PCI, percutaneous interventions, uh, as opposed to um, surgery, coronary, coronary artery bypass grafting. And uh, this study was in the framework of the syntax evaluation. Syntax is a method of grading how severe the coronary artery disease is based on how many stenoses there are, where they're located, and their degree. And what we see here is PCI and cabbage, if we just look at the raw data as they are, uh, there's absolutely no difference in terms of probability of death. And this is a follow-up now for a 10-year period. And if we look at five years compared to 10 years, no difference. And the baseline data are shown here. These are coronary artery disease patients. They're 65. A lot of them smokes. A lot of them have diabetes. They have hypertension, all these various things that are risk factors for that. But if we look at the patients with three vessel disease, I'm not certain that this is statistically significant. It looks like the cabbage group does a little better uh, than the PCI group. Whether or not this difference of 10 years is clinically that relevant, I'm not certain. Uh, but um, it, with three vessel disease, there seems to be a difference. <clears throat> and if we look at the severity of the syntax scores, with severe syntax scores, the cabbage group seems to do better than the PCI group. And that's shown in this forest plot here. So those are the 10-year data on the syntax study. Then the next paper is, um, is endoxaban better than warfarin in patients that have atrial fibrillation? And uh, this is a randomized open label phase 3B trial. And we have learned that yes, it looks like the new agents have advantages over warfarin. And so here are the patients there. 750 patients in both of these groups, atrial fibrillation, all the risk factors associated with that, the randomization seems to have been effective. And uh, it looks, if, uh, first of all, it looks like endoxaban is not inferior to warfarin. I guess we might have guessed that. Uh, but the test for superiority was not statistically significant. Although if we look at this graph, this graphical display, cumulative incidence of outcomes, it looks like endoxaban regimen was, might have been a little better uh, than um, warfarin. And if we combine this with the ease of management for the physician and the patient, I think that uh, warfarin's days are probably numbered. And uh, this is the cumulative rate of events that was statistically significantly better for endoxaban and com compared to vitamin K antagonist. So that was the outcome, added value. Um, looks like endoxaban is not a bad idea. Then you need to learn something about periodic repolarization dynamics. I wasn't familiar with this either. Uh, but this is a computerized evaluation of electrocardiograms in patients that receive defibrillators that have reduced ejection fractions. 
And as these patients are followed over time, their repolarization patterns can be, uh, and you need a computer to do this, can't do this by just looking at their EKGs, to see whether, the, whether or not the improvement in repolarization suggests that their sympathetic nervous systems are less active, particularly under stressful conditions. And if they are, their chances of needing to be shocked uh, might be lessened. So this, is, this study is a prediction of mortality benefits based on periodic repolarization dynamics. Can we predict mortality in patients carrying these things on the basis of a computer evaluation of their repolarization patterns in their electrocardiograms? And it might be that that's the case because the patients that had periodic repolarization dynamics of a substantial degrees uh, they seem to benefit more from ICD therapy than patients that did not have these dynamics. And this can be evaluated statistically and the results are shown here. So that was the basis of that study. So in addition to outfitting patients with these defibrillators, we can somehow predict on, on the, through time which patients really need the devices and which patients really didn't need them. Then this is a study in patients with multiple sclerosis. <clears throat> uh, the group here in our unit here at the ECRC uh, was involved in this study and this multiple sclerosis strategy involves the administration of a B cell depleting antibody we're not talking about CD20, we're talking about anti-CD19 antibody, and it looks like in these patients with multiple sclerosis in terms of probability of uh, no further attacks, the antibody group does substantially better. Uh, and um, uh, the, we can see that the B cell depletion is substantial in the patients that receive the antibody. And it seems that the treatment was fairly well tolerated. So I think that this will be an additional option for patients with neuromyelitis optica that have multiple sclerosis. Now, the reviews in the Lancet from two weeks ago concern frailty, which is a very important issue, and how frailty should be managed. I was not able to download these, but if you're involved in geriatrics, gerontology, or deal with older patients, uh, you should look at these reviews on frailty. And the patient two weeks ago in the Lancet, this is a 57-year-old patient that actually came in with hypothyroidism, autoimmune hypothyroidism. And subsequent treatment, the patients usually respond to then thyroid medication, and the conversion of hypothyroidism to hyperthyroidism is, I'd never heard of it, it's extremely uncommon. Whereas the reverse, patients developing hypothyroidism as, after having had Graves' disease is relatively common. But this patient that had autoimmune hypothyroidism showed up some months later with this shin lesion, and this is called pretibial myxedema. This is a striking example of pretibial myxedema. We can look at all these brown cell infiltrates in this biopsy. And the myxedema <clears throat> consists of mucopolysaccharide-like tissues that are also responsible for the eye changes. But this is a dramatic example of pretibial myxedema. And the authors also show their data. And we can see that um, this patient really did convert from hypothyroidism to Graves' disease and hyperthyroidism. Now, this week's New England Journal, here's the image. Looks like hand films. And again, we see calcinosis. And this calcinosis seems to be confined to the fingertips in this patient. And we're asked uh, what this might be in this 77-year-old lady. Uh, this is not tophaceous gout. And you can forget about metastatic chondrosarcoma to the fingertips. Vitamin D toxicity doesn't look like this. 
Myositis ossificans we'll look at later in the program, but this calcification does not involve skeletal muscle. So we're stuck with calcinosis, which is a generic term, and that's true. This patient actually had scleroderma, systemic sclerosis, and usually in scleroderma, when the fingertips are involved, the fingertips become obliterated. But this patient developed calcinosis of the fingertips. Rudolf Nissen was a German surgeon who was born in 1896. He served in the First World War in a battalion aid station, all four years of it, incidentally. Uh, he was decorated for his work. He also suffered a thoracic gunshot injury. Nevertheless, after the war was over, he was able to finish medical school in Marburg and in uh, Freiburg. And he became a, first a resident in internal medicine with Minkowski in uh, Breslau and then transferred to Berlin and completed a, res a surgical residency uh, in the department of Ferdinand Sauerbruch. He was a pretty good surgeon and ended up being Sauerbruch's right-hand person. Nissen developed an operation that we're going to look at at the moment, which is the standard operation for esophageal reflux. And this operation is named after Nissen. Now, when the Nazis took over, Nissen had to leave Germany. And he first went to Istanbul, where he was a professor of surgery, then went to New York. And in the United States, he had to take all, uh, repeat all his examinations, et cetera. But he became chief of surgery at um, the Maimonides Hospital in New York. After the war was over in 1952, he returned to Europe, not to Germany, uh, but to Switzerland, and published the paper on fundoplication for esophageal reflux in 1956. And this is a figure from his original work. This operation can now be done laparoscopically, uh, but it's basically the same operation that Nissen introduced, and it's called the Nissen operation. So the first paper in the New England Journal is a randomized trial of medical versus surgical treatment for refractory heartburn. And these patients didn't respond to H2 blockers and proton pump inhibitors and all the uh, things that are done for uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease. So these patients were then randomized to the Nissen operation and medical treatment or medical treatment alone. And the randomization scheme is shown here on the right. And what we see here is that Dr. Nissen's operation did pretty well. Uh, it, it beat active medical treatment, and it also beat controlled medical treatment where the doctors did pretty much what they wanted uh, and were a little less aggressive than the active medical treatment group. So it looks like Dr. Nissen's operation was successful in over two thirds of the patients. So there's an operation named after Dr. Nissen. There's no operation named after Ferdinand Sauerbruch, in case you were interested. The next topic is P2Y12 receptor blockade. P2Y12 receptors are expressed on platelets. They're G-protein coupled receptors. Uh, the ligand for P2Y12 is adenosine diphosphate. And it re, uh, activation of P2Y12 results in platelet ag aggravation. Platelet aggregation. We can block P2Y12 with uh, a number of different agents: ticlopidine, clopidogrel, prazogrel, and ticagrelor. We've discussed these agents earlier. Now, this randomized trial involve, compares ticagrelor or prazogrel, prazogrel in patients with acute coronary syndromes. 2,000 patients in each group, half of them got ticagrelor and the other half got 
fragile grail, it didn't occur to me that this hypothesis would be worth testing. But because uh, I would think both these agents are probably pretty good. Uh, but it looks like Prazograil beat Ticagrelor, not by much. The real difference is shown here, and it looks like the number needed to treat is about 50. Uh, but the bleeding episodes were the same in both groups. So Prazograil, which I'm sure is more expensive than Ticagrelor, seemed to be a little bit better without an increased risk in bleeding, so say the authors. And the next paper in the New England Journal involves malignant melanoma. I like to review the, the melanomas here on the left and the benign lesions here are on the right and asymmetry, border, color, uh, diameter and evolution are important. Uh, if you were to send all eight of these patients to biopsy, I wouldn't mind as long as you send these four at least. Now, patients with advanced melanoma uh, are treated with checkpoint inhibitors that involve PD-1, PD-1 ligand, or CTLA-4, and its appropriate ligand. And that can be blocked with antibodies. And the question that was asked in this uh, study in which we now have a five-year follow-up antibody against uh, PD-1 ligand signaling or CDL, uh, CTLA-4 signaling with ipilimumab. Uh, combination of these treatments, one drug compared to the other drug. So we have three groups in this evaluation. And it looks like the combination beats one drug and nivilumab is better than ipilimumab. And now we have a longer follow-up. Progression-free survival, not fantastic, but it's better than the results were earlier. So that it looks like two-point checkpoint inhibition will be the treatment of choice. And you can look at various subgroups and uh, median treatment free intervals and uh, details at your leisure. So checkpoint inhibition, Blocking two checkpoints better than just blocking one checkpoint and PD-1, PD-1 ligand signaling seems to be more effective than CTLA-4 signaling. And the next topic at the New England Journal is, is familial hypercholesterolemia, which is a mutation in the LDL receptor. Uh, if it's homozygous and you have no LDL receptors at all, then you have a real problem. And that's fortunately very uncommon. There are two or three patients in Berlin, four million population base, that have homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. In the Middle East, in Syria, for instance, uh, this circumstance is substantially more common. But it probably one in a thousand people are heterozygous for familial hypercholesterolemia. And uh, the way the LDL receptor works, we've discussed often before, but I've schematically outlined it for you here. And so this is a 20 year follow up on children with FH. This is heterozygous FH, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> and the question, we know that treating these patients lowers their LDL cholesterol and also lowers risk, including carotid edema media thickness. Now, if it's good on the short term, the hy uh, hypothesis here, is it also good in the long term? Well, why wouldn't it be? And it is. So follow-up, long-term follow-up of children with FH looks like their LDL cholesterols are lower compared to their unaffected siblings, which we would expect. And their freedom from cardiovascular events compared to their parents that weren't treated during their childhood with uh, uh, when they had FH because statins probably back then weren't available or freedom from death with cardiovascular disease indicates that these children, fairly obvious, uh, should be treated as soon as the diagnosis is made irrespective of their age forever. Here's the tongue again. And this patient who had pernicious anemia, non-anemic pernicious anemia, 
Look at how his tongue looks after treatment with vitamin B12 and his erythrocytes decrease in size as well. Now here's a patient with dermatomyositis with calcinosis, and this is calcification in the skeletal muscle area, dramatic, and with treatment, there's some improvement, although not complete resolution. And the review in the New England Journal concerns treating patients, directing attention to lipid metabolism, to lowering cardiovascular resist, uh, risk, either as a primary strategy or as a secondary strategy. And I've listed all the statins that are available and acetamoeba and uh, PCSK9 and uh, inhibitors the ones that are currently approved are antibodies, and then bile acid sequestrants and uh, uh, fatty acid treatments and fibra, uh, fibrates and niacin and this sort of thing. And the molecular biology of these routines are now well known. You, we've discussed these on numerous occasions, but you can check them out here. Um, and the Healthy lifestyle, always a good idea. Don't smoke. Uh, the 10 year risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, you can load it down as an app and put it on your phone. Statins remain the first line treatment. In patients that aren't adequately controlled, the poor ones get acetamoeba, the rich ones get PCSK9 inhibiting, inhib inhibition. The presence of type 2 diabetes is, has the same risk as already having had a myocardial infarction. And if the patients can afford it, you can get a coronary artery calcium score. And if all else fails, there's still some role for omega-3 icosapentaenoic acid treatment. And in the REDUCE-IT trial, there was a significant advantage for patients that were treated with EPA therapy. Patient in the New England Journal, 70 year old woman, develops rapidly progressive ataxia. She first presents no longer able to walk in a straight line and she has problems in her yoga class. Uh, she's sent to an ENT person who determines that she has normal hearing function some weeks later, she's no longer able to do a tandem gait and her Romberg sign. What that means is when she closes her eyes, she tends to fall over, is positive. So she's sent to physical therapy, which doesn't help. The next neurologist does some tests and these magnetic resonance imaging studies are basically normal. <clears throat> her blood work is also pretty normal and she has a lumbar puncture done, and it's also normal. So what could she have with these normal findings? So an EEG is done, and she's got a single sharp spike in the left parietal region, but never has it again. But several weeks later, she becomes dysarthric and has short-term memory loss, and then has major problems with eye movements as discussed here. And now her gait is profoundly impaired. And uh, somebody does a mini mental like assessment and she scores 15 on a scale of 30. In other words, she now has big time dementia. What sort of a progressive neurological syndrome moves this quickly with this particular pattern? That's what's asked here. And I was interested to learn in medical, when I was in medical school, the cerebellum was considered to be strictly a motor organ, but it also, as we know now, has cognitive and affective functions, which are also dis impaired in this patient. And she clearly has a cerebellar problem and eye movement problems. So discussed her toxic metabolic disorders, this is not arsenic poisoning. Could this be leptomeningeal carcinomatosis? Well, the imaging studies don't indicate that. And it didn't really seem to be a leptomeningeal problem. It seems to be a cerebellar degeneration. Could this be Kreutzfeldt-Jakob's disease? 
And yes, it could, because subsequent imaging studies show pyramidal findings and cerebellar findings that are outlined here. And an LP is done, and she now has tall proteins in her cerebrospinal fluid and also has an increased amount of another protein that's called 1433. So she has a combination of in increased levels of TAW and 1433 proteins in her cerebrospinal fluid. And as we learn, these findings are associated with Kreuzfeld Jakob's disease, which is a prion disease. Now, it was news to me that 1433 proteins are associated with Kreuzfeld Jakob's disease because I happen to know what 1433 proteins are. These are scaffolding proteins inside cells, and they are the sites at which enzymatic processes occur. Enzymatic processes don't necessarily just occur loosely in the cytoplasm. They're associated with microdomains. And 1433 proteins, there are seven families of these, uh, provide a scaffold for enzymatic reactions. And so this poor patient dies and leaves her brain to mass general, and we can now inspect it. And she has prions in her central nervous system. So this is Kreuzfeld Jakob's disease. She doesn't really have mad cow disease. The vast majority of these patients, and thank goodness this is very rare, have a sporadic form of Kreuzfeld Jakob's disease. The topic in the Lancet is remote ischemic preconditioning. And you might ask, what is this? Well, ischemic conditioning as such is the phenomenon that if we make an organ, heart, kidney, periodically ischemic, it then becomes resistant to a second dose of ischemia and seems to be resistant to, seems to be able to tolerate ischemia better. And remote ischemic conditioning, and this is difficult to understand it, I don't know how this works either, is uh, subjecting some skeletal muscle in the body to episodes of ischemia, which is then said to protect the heart, which is some distance away, from ischemia. And that's called remote ischemic conditioning. So we have a stimulus. The arm is commonly used in these studies. Four cycles of five minutes of limb ischemia and five minutes of reperfusion. That performs, and I don't know how this works, but that performs release. Of pre presumably some substances are released here that have cellular signaling effects. In the organ, we're talking about the heart, could also involve the brain, liver, kidneys, et cetera, from a subsequent episode of ischemia. This is apparently no humbug, although this trial doesn't help this notion very much. This is a large randomized trial to examine a remote ischemic condition on clinical outcomes in patients with acute myocardial infarction. This is a single blind randomized controlled trial. So there are a large number of patients, 2,500 in each group. Randomization seems to be reasonable. And uh, can we make the patients better with remote ischemic conditioning? And not really. The effects here are not statistically significant. They don't even come close. And if we look at this forest plot, favors control versus re favors remote ischemic preconditioning, no significant difference. But perhaps this is the wrong hypothesis. Perhaps ischemic preconditioning should be applied in a large study of patients that are undergoing coronary bypass grafting or PCI, uh, because that was not the question that was asked in this study. But there were no benefits on either myocardial infarct size or clinical outcomes at 12 months in these patients with ST segment elevation MIs.
But once the, this is developed, perhaps that's too late to test this notion. Reviews in the Lancet colorectal cancer, terribly important clinical problem. Uh, we have to, when we look at uh, incidence and prevalence throughout the world, we have to adjust this for the ages of the populations. Uh, both of these graphs give us the same kinds of information. The darker it is, the more common is the disease. And uh, we know that there are modifiable risk factors. Don't do these things, eat lots of fruits and vegetables, don't be fat, eat whole grains, all of these, these things are good for you. And other factors, aspirin may play a role here. Some people speculate on statin use. Then there are hereditary factors, and we know about these. There are also Mendelian forms of colon cancer, either associated with polyposis or not. And you should all know about the Amsterdam criteria, et cetera. Now, Bert Fogelstein showed us the genetic process that is involved in colorectal cancers. And so we've learned about <clears throat> microsatellite stability, and we've learned about APC mutations and KRAS and BRAF and these various things, culminating in P53 mutations, colon cancer. Nice graft on a uh, nice graphic display on where these things occur and what the mutations are associated with right side versus left side and uh, uh, shown here. And there are uh, colonoscopy, of course, has been a game changer in this disease. But even during colonoscopy, there's some imaging techniques that are being developed now to help the gastroenterologist make the diagnosis. And what we can do for these patients is also improved. And you'll recall two weeks ago, we discussed cancer signatures and the signature for colorectal cancer is improving, although there's still room for additional improvement. The second review is on hepatitis C. Great strides have been made here, if you can afford it. The, the distribution of hepatitis C worldwide we've discussed before great drugs to combat hepatitis C, irrespective of genotype. It's expensive, but highly effective treatments, and this has been a great advance in the treatment of this disease, which could theoretically be eradicated wor wor worldwide, and the financial investment is a function of something that we'll have to deal with. So hepatitis C virus is a global health problem, but we could cure it if we had the will to do so. Then there's this patient, 28-year-old man <clears throat> who is a Tamil, comes in with uh, complaining of, he's got copper-colored patches on his skin, and an examination is done, and he's got peripheral nerve findings in that the nerves become palpable, which is common in Lepromatous leprosy. So these lesions are biopsied and he's actually got leprosy. And leprosy is treated with MTD, uh, which is a three drug treatment that consists of um, rifampin, dapsone, and clofazamine. And so he's given this treatment and comes back several weeks later complaining of uh, systemic worsening of his condition. He's got severe constitutional symptoms, fever, his neuro neuropathy is worse, and the lesions on his skin are now palpable. And this is a reaction that's seen in patients that have leprosy that undergo treatment. So his treatment is modified somewhat, decreased in intensity. He's treated with steroids, has some improvement. And here's an example. Here's how he comes in initially, and here are these plaques, these patches. They're not raised, they're flat. And with treatment, these patches, look at these here, they suddenly become palpable and increased markedly in size. And this reaction is fairly typical and is seen in patients with leprosy who receive the right treatment. He's going to have to have it anyway but modification in his treatment is done and presumably he improves. Thank you for your attention. If you wanna hear all this business in German, stick around and 10 minutes we'll repeat the whole story in that language.
Otherwise, next week, Wednesday. Bitte, bitte. Ja. Die wollen alle Englisch. Die brauchen Englisch. Aber manche Leute sprechen ganz gerne Deutsch. Das ist bemerkenswert. Ich spreche auch ganz gerne. Schauen wir mal, ob ich es auf Deutsch auch schaue. Aber das Nette ist, dass sie immer 